for today, what I'd love to do is just spend a little bit of time with you hiding some owls. Let's play hide the owl. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is we're going to draw a, uh, a form and then we're going to hide it. So cryptic coloration is really, really interesting. Um, the idea is how can you not be seen by either your predators or your prey? And um, so this is great. So having cryptic coloration is great for the animals themselves, but it's very challenging for artists because very often as an artist, what you're trying to do is to describe the form and bring the form forward. But the goal of the camouflage animal is the opposite of that. They want to blend in and be a part of the environment that they're in. And so if I am drawing these things true to life, sometimes you look at it and the, well, let's, let's actually show rather than tell. One moment. We're going to jump over to this camera. And we're going to jump over to this map. All right, let's bounce down. Um, here is, here's the challenge of cryptic coloration. Let's say an owl pops up. Um, and it's sitting out there, you find it in the daylight. And so I'm just sort of drawing in a ball for its head, kind of an angle along whatever side of its body makes the most interesting negative shape. And I'm going to look at how the side of its head kind of connects with the body in there. So essentially at the start, I'm trying to get my head attached to my body and then figuring out how big a body do I want. Is this a little Western screech owl like this? Um, or is this more of a long-eared owl, which has a longer body? Or maybe I would make this a great horned owl. Um, owls have that wonderful X face. Um, and what the owl wants to do is during the day, have you not see it. So the fact that you see this owl means that something has gone wrong. The owl has been spotted by you. And its, it's goal, though, is, is to stay hidden during the day so that it can get a good night's sleep and or a good day's sleep. And then the next day be out the, uh, the next, sorry, the next night be out there to, to catch all of its neighbors. Let me... Uh, bring up on the screen a uh, hold on a sec. I'm going to bring up a photograph of an owl and one moment we can Search this. Um, I'm going to take one moment to set up my screen screens so that you can see me draw and we can also see um, photographs. I'm going to be going over to the website birdpixel.com, which is the website of uh, Vivek Kenzode. Um, and I'm going to type Oh, here we go. Um, I am going to share screen, share my desktop. All right. So 
Um, I'm going to go to birdpixel.com. I'm going to type in owls. Actually, just owl singular. And all these photographs come up. And so what you're seeing here is examples of all sorts of really cool cryptic coloration. This looks like, um, you know, the camouflage that soldiers wear because it functions in exactly the same way. What that animal wants is for your eye to skip over the critter and just associate what it is with the background. So it wants to connect into the background. If you look into the background here in these little places back in the grass, there's little dark spots, there's little kind of clumps of light. So the owl has made itself into dark spots and little clumps of light, sometimes in a line, sometimes in a line. Um, but that is, that's, that's great for hiding. Um, when the owl sort of pops out, so photographers are often looking for an angle where they can see the owl um, against a backdrop where it doesn't blend in because that makes for a good photograph. But very often you're going to find when you're out there that these little beasties are just they're, they're, they're hidden. They just sort of feel like a part of their uh, part of the environment around them. So I am going to go to, let's see, I'm going to look for some long-eared owls because very often they are, let's no, let's just kind of go with, yeah, I'm just, Look, look, look at <laughs> this. This looks like um, the, the, on the Galapagos Islands, there are um, short-eared owls that are really, really dark. And look at the color of the lava rock around it. And then look at the owl, lava rock owl, lava rock owl. <laughs> it's, it, this, this makes for a drawing that if you're drawing what you actually see, it it's going to be difficult for you. Let's, I'm going to type in long-eared owl. Long-eared owl. Hmm. These beasties really blend in. So <clears throat> this one's in a slightly different posture than what I've started here. But I'm just going to do another one over here. I like to just sort of you know, pet the bird, sort of imagine that the sort of what is the line down at the side, I'm going to put a little ball for its head. And here it is. Um, I'm going to put crosshairs through the middle of its head through its eyes and the center of its head. And then this bird's face is there's a big V down the middle of its face. Let me see if I can lock my focus here. Um, first focus, so it's not going to focus on my hand as, no, let's get a little bit more crisp than that. One second, manual focus. That's pretty good. So stick with that focus. And what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to point out a couple of features of sort of strategies that you'll see in camouflage that actually, before I kind of jump back to this, let's look at a few features of camouflage that make birds blend in better. Um, I'm going to draw a generic bird out here, little profile. And this perhaps is some species of a warbler. And what you're going to find is that 
on many birds, there is a similar general coloration pattern. And so here is my, my head. Um, trick number one, this is a really easy way to get seen. Uh, it's still a little bit blurry. I'm gonna see if I can just trim the focus here a little bit more. All right. If I have a big eye sitting in the middle of my head, then um, I am going to be, the predators will see that very easily. My prey will see that very easily. So what a lot of animals do, first of all, is they're going to hide their eye. That's the purpose of the eye line. That little stripe through the eye is going to make that circle feel more like a stick. If you want to scare your predator, your prey items, do this. Give them two eyes staring at you, and most prey critters will take off because they know they're in somebody's sights. This is a danger sign when something is looking straight at you. So, number one, hide your eye. Um, and so you often will have a dark bar through the eye, and Streaking then feels like um, streaks just sort of feel like like you know pale sticks. Another general pattern here is my going to be my wing, my tail. Another general pattern is dark on the back. And the reason for that is that most critters, here's an egg. If I have a shadow on an object, the minute I put this shadow in, you, the viewer, are starting to kind of be able to see and understand the form that I am drawing here, All right? This is a lot easier to understand than this. That shadow is extremely useful for us to describe the form and shape of, of an object. However, it also alerts predators to what your contours are. So just as it helps a drawing look three-dimensional, it helps the bird look three-dimensional. So if my light is coming in here from the top, my shadow is cast on this side. If I see that on, on a birdie, that is going to um, really reveal the form of that bird. So birds, fish, mammals, just about everybody out there uses a trick called counter shading. And what that is, is that in the colors on your body, you have dark on top and light on the bottom. Dark on top, light on the bottom. And so if you take these two effects and you merge them together, you get dark on top, light on the bottom. And what is the shadow doing? The shadow is dark on the bottom. Light on the top. And that flattens out the form. So the reason that you see this pattern in fish, in birds, in all sorts of different organisms, is that by having dark on top, light on the bottom, you are able to hide better in plain sight. So you'll find because the shadow is often darkest down here, you'll find a lot of birds will have, in this part of their feather, it's a little bit darker here than, and often really lighter here, a slight fade over here. 
<clears throat> now, when we make field guides, what we do is we want to show people what are the patterns on the bird. If we draw them the way we actually see in the wild, it's much less useful. So what people who make field guides do is they say, let's show this bird in imaginary light. And imaginary light, what we'll often do is have a little bit of shadow down here just to sort of suggest the form. But we really want, we don't want that to be so dark that it starts to feel like a pattern on the animal. So in field guides, we want people to see what are just the colors of the feathers. And so Peterson, Sibley, me, all the people who are making field guides, we're drawing these birds in this sort of weird imaginary light to highlight the, co the contrast of its feathers. We'll have just enough shadow to suggest its roundness, but that's not actually what we see. So trick number one is counter shading. Right? And so squint over at that photograph of the owl and you'll notice that its belly, which is more pale than its back, is when you squint at it, is really pretty dark. So there's trick number one. If we're drawing things the way they really have patterns, um, we're going to find that the shadows are a really big part of what goes on. And then the sunlight hits the belly, the back of this thing. You'll find in real life, sometimes a real bird sitting in bright sunlight, let's say it has a dark brown back and it has a, a white belly. When you see that real bird in sunlight, you can often see that its dark brown back is lighter than its white belly because it's catching direct sunlight. That's hitting the sun, and that white belly is actually darker. So if we're drawing birds with cryptic coloration, we want to pay attention to what the light is actually doing. So rather than drawing the field guide image of, I'm going to draw the back dark because it has dark feathers there, I'm going to really draw what I see. That's trick number one. So actually, that's trick number two. So hiding trick number one, let's hide our eye. Hiding trick number two, let's have counter shading. And hiding trick number three is disruptive coloration. If I can get you to um, associate patterns on me, with patterns in the environment. Our eye will blur past the bird or blur past the object that whatever is hiding. So very often you will have uh, lines that are going to go across your, your, your object or patterns, what that we're trying to do is if there are patterns like this in the environment, we want to have those on our own body. So what does this mean for this little owl? All right, so here's my little owl friend over here. I'm going to give it a few little horns. This is kind of cool. You see the sort of neck chest area in here. Uh, down below that, I have its body coming in. And what it's, take a look at that tangle of branches behind the bird. See these tangles of branches, some going this way, some going this way. Now look at the belly of this bird. Some lines going this way, some going this way. Huh. 
This background feels a lot like this pattern here. So if I want this to, to, to sh if I want to show this cryptic coloration, I want my drawing to bend in, blend in with my background. Um, for drawing the marks themselves, um, <clears throat> let's, we'll kind of, we'll, we'll get into uh, some of that, but let's first just sort of think about sort of where is this bird light and dark? I've kind of got a dark wedge coming down its face. I have dark coming in here as little commas on either side. I have, there's sort of, it's darker feathers in the middle. The wing over here is darker. A little bit of dark here. I'm just sort of initially kind of looking at what are sort of lights and darks in the feathers. What is going on with the, oh yeah, and then I have uh, in this area here, there's sort of an area where the eyes and shadow are. Now, this side of the bird is all in shadow. And now there are some darker patterns. Up in here in this upper chest zone, there are sort of blurry streaks. Down here in the wing, if I have a little individual owl feather here, you'll find very often they have sort of a central dark part with little bars going across them. And these will sometimes line up so that the bars, your, your eye kind of carries across, uh, uh, across that whole bar. So um, I've got little lines down. I'm going to draw these sort of down lines first. Here are some edges of the wing. And then there's some little crossbars. On the chest, I've got lines that go down. And then I have lines that go across those. The edges of these feathers are really hard to determine, and that's that's part of what the owl wants. So if I get in here and I articulate a bunch of these feathers too much, it is going to feel like I'm drawing a feather diagram rather than this kind of hidden cryptic jumble. And now if I want this bird to, to fit Ah, oh, that's still a little bit blurry. I wonder if I can... I'm going to just try to spend a little bit more time adjust the camera, see if... Um, mm, this will have to do. All right. So, but if, if I have this, I'll sit in here... Like, like this, it, 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 it pops out from the landscape. I want this owl to be hidden. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a bunch of these same marks. There's, there's, there's foliage back here. And notice I am, as I'm doing this, I'm actually coming into my owl. And there's branches that go back here.
And there is a big branch that goes across. Where is, aha. Uh -huh. this little branch that's coming here. I used a, this is a, what's called a mono zero eraser. This is very thin little eraser. And I use that to create a, um, a branch going across here. And so I want some of the same sorts of marks, the same sorts of lines that are in the L also in the environment. And then the L feels much more like it is a part of that environment back there. Let's take a look at a screech owl. So cool. And just look at the, the way that these, 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 these feathers um, went in little, little brown and gray dark stripes, little brown and gray dark stripes. I want, I want the marks on my owl to be similar to what I'm showing back there. Squint at this and you'll see that you know, the as we kind of come in here, this edge of between tree and owl is fairly indistinct. The owl wants that. The owl is trying to make that happen. Um, so let me we have a a little owl and its little owl friend and they are in a little hole in the tree And this owl's head is in here. And owls have a big X on their face. One big ear patch over here, one big ear patch over here. A little tiny. Whereas this one is kind of looking towards us here. And Something that's also fun about this one is look at the size of the pupils on those two owls. Isn't that interesting? The one on the right has much larger pupils. If you have an idea what's going on with that, drop that into the chat. Oh, question was asked about what kind of sketchbook I'm using. I just picked this up from, this is a, a Strathmore mixed media paper book um, it was just a big sheet of it's not what I really use in the field because I prefer not to use spiral bound things but for doing demonstrations um, on video I find a um, it's very helpful to have a uh, <clears throat> a spiral bound book rather than a one bound down the center 
That's right. The owl on the left is out in the light more, and you see their eyes are, 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 are different sizes. Now, question number two. Take a look at the right-hand owl. What do you notice about the sizes of its two pupils? Drop that into the chat if you see something odd going on there. So here I'm going to kind of get into the idea of what's called lost and found edges. Um, I'm going to have a basic owl shape here. And um, I'm going to start just by putting in sort of some light and, and shadow. That's right. So owls can make their pupils, they will dilate differently. Now, human beings, if you saw that, that would be an evidence of brain damage, but not with the owl. Um, owl's eyes respond independently to whatever light is on them. Isn't that cool? Um, so I've got a little owl over here. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make, put these owls in their context. They are in this dark cavern here. Isn't it nice how I can kind of really quickly cover a bunch of area with dark here, that this smooth dark? That's because if you take a look at my pencil tip, it is beveled to an edge because I've been sort of drawing on one edge and then it's got a big flat tip. This is a 0.7 meter, millimeter mechanical pencil. So here is what I'm first doing is just sort of saying that here's the, the darkness of my hole. And then I want the owls to sort of feel at home in it. So this owl is in more shadow. And this part of the owl hole is in more shadow. So you see how I'm bringing the environment strokes into the owl. This owl over here is in more light. So lighter work and then it's getting a little bit more into shadow as we kind of go back here. So I'm getting these owls starting to, 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 to hide, to blend into the, the darkness of this little crevice here. And the outside edges of this. Now, the owl has these markings on its body, and what it wants you to do is to, or I'd say, or I should say, all its ancestors that where this didn't work, they got eaten by somebody else, or they didn't get enough to eat. But they, the idea is that these marks tie in with marks in the wood around it. Maybe the eyes on that one on the left are so prominent. I'm going to lighten them in here just to make those eyes pop a little bit, just sort of erased into those a little bit. Now, a little bit of detail in part of a drawing, especially around the eyes. People will always look at the eyes of whatever you draw. 
So slowing down and being a little bit more careful in that part of a drawing. And I'm going to add a few more kind of cracks into the wood. So if, I, if there's a sort of general principle, it's to bring the shadow colors, the shadow forms or the, the, the form of the, the, the environment into, into the bird or the birds, whatever you're using sort of for, for bird texture, you bring that into the environment. I mean, and, and also think about how details and marks can also blend. And if you can have any lost and found edges, um, having a place where, um, the the boundary between bird and um, the boundary between bird and the environment is a little bit less distinct. Now I'm going to drop a little bit of color on this. I have a watercolor set near me. And there are some, let's see, some browns that are around, around the tree. There are also some browns in the birdie here, and I'm going to bring those browns of the environment into the bird. So I want to use the same colors in both of those. As I'm painting here, my brush is slowly running out of paint. It started really, really black. And now if you take a look off on the side, it's more of a gray. So I'm not going to go refill it. I'm going to use that to get these little owls to further 
blend in. Look at that crisp edge there. I don't want that. I want to see if I can lose some of that edge. So colors of the environment in the animals, um, patterns that patterns that I see. In the environment, I look for ways of including those in the animals themselves. So now I'm going to take some of this dark and I'm going to bring it into my little owl friends. The brush I'm using is the large fine point aquash brush that is uh, from Pentel. I like that brush a lot. And a final little piece of this. I'm going to see if I can add in just a few of the little horizontals in these feathers here. Uh, Ann Caudill, the uh, instructor at, um, used to be at the University of Santa Cruz in the scientific illustration program, now at Cal State Monterey Bay, their scientific illustration program, always talks about at the end of a drawing, just kind of coming back and crisping up some of the details, finding some of the edges, kind of get your pencil and just sort of pop a few of those details um, a little bit more.
Let's do one last uh, little piece here. Uh, actually, it's 11 o'clock. Um, let's do part of the feathers of a great horned owl. Um, Yeah. So this is a juvenile great horned owl. Um, it hasn't, doesn't have its uh, great horns yet. Um, but you see here that there's just, you're, you're seeing a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of fine detail. And so don't get don't get lost in that at the start. Let's see what we can do with this with this little owl shape here. Um, it's got a little head. It has a, a chest that's coming down pretty straight. And when you kind of come off the back, there's a little bit of a back and that curves around. Gives you sort of a lump of an owl with the head more on the left side than the right. I like to put in the center line, where is it looking? It's looking more to the left. So this line coming down through the middle of the head, it's more on the left and then eyes across here. When you're drawing an owl, the eye on the far side will have a very different shape than the eye that is on the side closest to you. So look for especially the shape of the eye on the far side of the head. Owls have this very prominent facial disc. Notice how foreshortened and small the facial disc is on the left compared with the facial disc on the right. Much bigger facial disc on the right. We have some fluff of the head sticking out on the right. We don't have that on the left. If you look down the middle of the bird, you can see the zipper where it zipped up its bird suit. Right there. That line right down the middle of the belly. There's a big pad of feathers on this side, a big pad of feathers on that side. That's where they come together. There's an upper portion that has darker feathers. And I'm going to think of that as kind of arching across the bird because I want to think of this as a rounded form. And it's sitting on a log that's coming up. And we have a little bit, a lot of tail sticking down. See part of its wing sticking down there. Undertail coverts and tail. So let's just think about, so here I've, I want to, as I'm carving this, I want to think of it, I want to first kind of get the contours of the bird and then we'll try to get the details. Before I do that, look at how my bird is way too skinny. It's too narrow side to side. The nice thing about starting with some, with a kind of light pencil drawing is that I will have an opportunity to change, to change that sort of detail if I can catch it. So I did catch it. So what I want to do now is I want to make my back bigger, give Birdie more back. Okay. 
Wow, I've added all this little zone in there. And here, this little line, that's the edge of its scapulars. I'm seeing um, part of my branch sticking up here and obscuring a lot of the rest of the wing. Notice that it is hard to see the edges of individual feathers here. They all blend together in this patterned mass. Now let's think of sculpting this bird. Those lines in the feathers kind of give me cross contour lines. Cross contour lines are if I have some sort of a shape, let's say a cylinder here, a cross contour line goes across the contours of that. So here, I have these lines that are coming up at an angle here. And they are coming over here. And then they are kind of arcing up a little bit here. And then I've got my dark zone. <clears throat> If I can get some of those guidelines at the start, that's going to help me. Now let's continue to think of this thing as a big rounded form. I want to think of this essentially as a big, I've got it, lines that are kind of coming up and wrapping around, coming, coming up and wrapping around. I want to think of this as a big rounded form. First, I was thinking um, I would really ignore the face here, but I can't because owl faces are just so much fun. But notice as I am kind of carving up the face here, I'm really paying attention to the difference in angles on the side closest to me versus the side farther away from me and the difference in the shapes of the eyes that is going to be very helpful in carving this bird it's a little pad of gray here and notice how there's just this little pad of gray here on the side of the face notice how small and foreshortened it is on the other side. Huh, that's really interesting. I couldn't help but kind of play with that head a little bit. Give this one some little fuzz sticking out. Now, what about this upper chest? I want to think of this as kind of fluffing out towards me. That's going to fluff out around like that. <clears throat> and there are dark marks on it. And what I'm going to do is the secret here for making these marks is to be regularly irregular. Regularly irregular. So if I come across and I go like, oh, you've got bars, and I draw them symmetrically across it, that's not going to work. I also don't want to get them, um, they're going to suggest the curvature of that form. So I want to wrap it around that rounded shape, which means that as I get more in the center here, see how this one is more curved? More curved, a little bit of curve here, and then this was straight. Again, diagrammatically, that's more curved, a little bit of curve, and straight. That's what's going on there. And you see how that kind of suggests a little bit of rounding going on. And now this one, I'm going to curve this way just a little bit. 
So I want the person's eye then to see this part as being marks going that way. I have my major dark marks. And then I'm going to put a few white lines across that. What about down on the chest? There's going to be a few dark marks. There's sort of an area here I'm going to put just sort of a little blotchy dark. Put a little bit of blotchy dark in here. A little bit of blotchy dark. Maybe with some horizontalness to those lines kind of coming in here. And now I'm going to wrap these lines, these other lines, sort of around this. What about in front of me here? These ones are going to come down a little bit. In here, they're horizontal. And here, we're going to sort of suggest marks what about in here just look at this in terms of where it's darker where it's lighter and i'm going to put in there's a, going to be a darker streak and notice how i'm kind of making this jiggly i'm not going like this and making a square edge block i'm making a jiggly regularly irregular dark line in here regularly a regular dark line in here regular and in here we've got more of with a shadow under the scapulars is And then in between, we're just going to have little, I want it to be darker than this. And I have this, we're rudely interrupted by the tree branch. Down below, on the underside, we're mostly in shadow. I have some big feathers that are sticking out. And those have a little bit of barring on them. I can see there's some other feathers down here. I have a wing that droops down in here. But most importantly, this is dark. Add a little bit of dark under the belly here. And that connects this with this. Let's put some dark underneath our branch here. And I can let that pencil shading cross over from, from bird to branch.
So that's how I might go about creating these sorts of textures there on the tummy. If this is a watercolor painting, I'm first going to just drop in some general shadows. few little warm And lastly, maybe I'll get in there with some of these darks. And I make these sort of patterns by a combination of sort of blotchy or linear verticals combined with um, combining those with the sort of the, the, the fine lines that we're going to bar across the belly. So we have these big marks. And then there are smaller ones that go across that. <clears throat>
last thing, I think I want just a little bit more warmth. So I'm just going to take some yellow paint and put it in. All right. Um, that is some thoughts on drawing those complex patterns. Um, and I hope that there were some useful ideas in that. Um, if I am, um, thanks, man. Um, if I'm trying to make something kind of appear part of its environment, I want to put uh, sort of draw some of that environment onto the bird. Um, pay attention to what patterns of, of, of big darks and lights are. And remember you're with this, you're fighting against the, um, the bird's camouflage system. Very often we want to, to, to make the bird really pop out. But birds that are well camouflaged will sink into their environment. So one great way of doing that is to make the um, is to make the uh, sort of pull that environment over and onto and in, into the bird. Let me change my. Microphone. There we go. Um, so does anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts, or ideas? And uh, so you can just raise your hand and uh, I'll have you join me. You can use the raise hand function. Um, you can also, um, wherever you are, just put up your, your paw and I will notice you. Um, let's join uh, Finn in the Sierra. Add you into the spotlight here and in just a moment. Now you can unmute. Hi. So I think my screen is frozen, but so I want to show you the drawing I did for the camouflage. Um, uh, see, move, yeah, uh, maybe tr if you turn off the filter, there we go. If the, the, the blur filter in the back is unfortunately blurring the drawing that you did. If you feel comfortable having a see that, yeah, there we go. Um, that's, that's what, now hold that up again. Now a little bit more to your, there we go. There we are. I, in, I did a field mouse instead. Oh, fun. Yeah. yeah, and bringing the same colors of the field mouse, uh, the, the background colors into the mouse so it can blend in more. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't have a really strong uh, shadow on the belly of the mouse because of the counter shading. So um, that's, that's really fun. You've got those two principles of sort of, you've got the, the, the sort of the background colors very matching what you're seeing. And then you have the, uh, um, no really strong shadow on the on the belly kind of so that you 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 merge those together That's yeah great. thanks thank you for showing that finn you're welcome all right let's take a look at uh susan see what is happening in your journal so susan you can uh, mute, and you're now added into the spotlight. Hi there, how are you doing? Hi, great. Hey, I, you know, I was, I was, I was thinking, um, just related to this topic, um, uh, this idea of bringing in the, you know, actually showing the camouflage as camouflage and bringing in the colors and patterns of the background into the animal and vice versa, made me think of the art of Bev Doolittle. Have you seen her? <laughs> yes. Well, very often there'll be like, you know, a horse or, Something uh, you know in the, yeah. the, in the well, background. You see these like aspen trees, and it's just a bunch of aspens, and you can't really make sense of it. And then you look closely, and yeah, there there's like a perfect horse 
right in there that has exactly the spots of it or you know or there'd be like an eagle but it's but the the marks of the of the eagle are, are exactly the same as the around it is yeah so just yeah, um I, I'll, I'll love that her, her stuff is, is really really um, playful i really like that I I, mm -hmm. I I feel a little bit uncomfortable with sometimes she's sort of I think a, a, appropriating Native American iconography yeah. Um, yeah. and and is sort of poaching on, romanticizing the old West in a way that is maybe not yeah. in the years but but also yeah. incredibly technically precise and then you look at her drawings and you realize wow that's a really great uh, painting of somebody kind of hanging out by the by the glaciers and then you realize that they're actually being looking looked down upon by five bears in the mountains you can start playing <laughs> you know find the bears and uh really creative really beautiful work um and uh yeah and i do agree on the, some some of the the uh, some, you know sort of i guess you know questionable or problematic aspects of some of the yeah definitely for for technique and and ideas it definitely is it's really fun to look at yeah and also just incredibly creative and also when she was painting those those things i think that all of us we didn't really have on our radar as much as we do now the ideas of um of kind of cultural appropriation um yeah and so uh the um and and so so now that you know that those sort of things are, are much more on 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 people's radar and when she was painting those it i don't think i ha even had that vocabulary to to think about those concepts and sometimes it's interesting when a word when terms sort of come to us then we um then we start to see those but i i, I love what she does i i, I think she's she's <laughs> She's, she's brilliant. Yeah. And, and, I think, and also, I think you know, we, we can definitely, we can, we can appreciate the, the, the qualities we want to appreciate in an artist's work while also acknowledging the aspects that are, you know, that are, you know, not necessarily as good. And, you know, there, there's, always, yeah. there's always a balance. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are, yeah, those are fun. Um, or, or, you know, the, the, you know, just you look at the snow fields and then you realize that that, that you both successfully made those look like snowfields and the snowfields are a herd of horses that are running you know you're just like okay right. you had me at snowfields but that mm -hmm. is that's pretty cool mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. yeah thank I, you I, yes I, I don't know if you want to you know stick to just you know topics related to this or well i, I guess this is sort of a bit of my in my I would love to see what you've been up to. So, well, so this was very timely. I think it was one of the ones who seconded the idea of cryptic coloration because um, this, this Saturday was Hawk Watch Day at Badger Park, which is on this this overlook. There's a sort of an escarpment that overlooks the Hudson Valley. And I just found out the day before that this was happening. And the idea was this whole big festival to watch the migrating hawks. Although as it turns out, we did not see very many possibly because we haven't had much cold weather yet. So we did see a few, but not necessarily hordes of them. But the reason I specifically wanted to go is because I knew there would be a few um, falconers and wildlife re rehabilitators and sort of two in one um, who would have some birds right there for us to look at, which turned out to be the case. It was very exciting. So I got to, uh, Get up, up close and, and personal, somewhat up close and a little, little personal with Ooh. some uh, uh, fox and, and other birds of prey. So this, hence the screech owl, which yeah, they have such complicated markings. And this, I mean, I was right up close to it, and of course, because it was on someone's hand, it wasn't you know yeah. in this camouflaged environment, so you could actually see it. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I really, I kind of simplified the markings down to just these little. You know things here, but it was so complicated. Yes. I took some, some photos, maybe try and you know play around with that some more because it's just, just really cool bird. But yeah, and this this was uh, there were I don't know there were like there were like ten different birds that they had between the, the two of them, and I I you know was like kid in the candy shop and know what to what to do, but I uh, uh, so I only, only ended up sketching a few of them, but uh, this was this one was kind of fun. Um, and then uh, we did in fact get to see a nice wild hawk show up. Um, so from a distance, so that was uh, that's fun. I, I was 
going to try and go for a you know closer view oh, of the knock and then it blew off. Yes. And then I need to move my favorites. Oh, that's fun. I love the three quarter views on Houdini, the turkey vulture here. Yeah, he was he was um, on on his, his human's uh, hand um, when I was doing this. So I got people like close, but of course he's looking around at everything. So I was trying to you know get a few different poses and do their thing of going back to each one of them. Their faces are so cool, but they're just like so shaped. You know? <laughs> so, yes. It's just yeah. it's really really challenging to to get this. So I I will I will again I want to I want to go back and do more turkey vultures. You know I've been, I've got some photos and things and I really try and get like the highlights and everything because they have that very shiny you know like you know bare skin that that uh, even though we're not in strong light because they were in the shades so that was actually kind of helpful because it meant that I could really get some detail. Um, you know, but to try and get that that pinkness and the and the gloss where it was glossy and everything. So, did not get a chance to do that in in the moment there, but uh, it was fun. Uh, and 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 uh, this was sort of my attempt. Oh, I love larger. that big that hunch of the vulture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and then of course, again, he kept like raising his head, and lowering his head, and I was just trying to like pick something. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was really, really fantastic. And, and I, I love turkey vultures and you know, they're, I, they're there all the time, but they're always so far away. So I get to actually see one up close. This, this, so, so, but the, the, there's a little bit of a story though, which is that this one, um, it was uh, uh, the woman who, who had a bunch of these birds. She's a wildlife rehabilitator. And this is one that she couldn't release. She says he is fully flighted and he has an enclosure that he can fly a bit in. Um, but she can't release him because he was imprinted on humans. And um, uh. so, you know, like if you release him, then he might, you know, approach people and, you know, and then get too close to roads and things. And, and also, I did not know this, apparently um, when they imprint on humans, they sort of think that like, instead of going for like, a nice lady bird to go and, you know, have fun times with, they would go for a human to have those kinds of fun times with uh, and that could be very bad that and of could course be, he's huge and he could seriously hurt somebody so yeah um, that could be yeah. awkward that could be awkward yeah so you know i love turkey vultures i think he's very handsome but you know not that way um but here but this is the thing though so all these birds were like attached by their jesses and they had a certain you know length of, of rope attached to a perch that they could perch on so they were just hanging out and um he's sitting there, sitting there, you know, kind of in, in the, the background area, just hanging out on the grass on his perch. All of a sudden he takes off and he flies away. Because apparently he'd been picking at his jesses and had managed to like wear through the part where it was attached to oh, wow. the security. So, the, so his owner is like clearly trying to like, you know, not panic in front of the public and her birds and everything like that, but is like freaking out because it's just, there's a reason he can't be released and he might die and he flew across the road and into the trees and you know so basically this was very exciting um to as somebody who does not have a personal stake in it because you're seeing the big profile what happened but yeah so one of the other women who, who was a falconer who had just a few birds that she was able to secure and then come over and keep an eye on the other birds that this other woman had and like talk to the public and everything like that and basically sort of watch over things so that she could go and try and track down the turkey vulture, who probably has flown more on this one day than has ever flown in his life. And of course, there are other turkey vultures all around. So if you see a turkey vulture, it might not be that. One. So wow. fortunately, there was a Girl Scout troop that was taking a little hike in, in, the, in, the, in the park um, in a general direction. And there, so a woman who was still uh, you know, at the area of the, of the, the festival was able to text with them and tell them to look out for it. And they actually spotted the turkey vulture and they could tell it was him because he had the, the jessets on his feet still. Mm -hmm. um, so they were able to actually track him down. And yeah, so fortunately, then she was able to get him back and he was, he was perfectly fine, had a little adventure. No so what, but was then it for the last hour. Hmm? Was it named so, Houdini before uh, this or is this no, your name? No, I, I think in general, she doesn't name her birds. But uh, this one, she, she had to be were Houdini asking, what's his name? And she says, well, now it's Houdini. So, yeah. That's <laughs> um, really so hopefully fun. hopefully that'll be the last, the last time I have a jam. So, so the result was, is that 
um, for the last like 45 minutes or so of this whole festival, she just had to stand there with this 12 pound turkey vulture on her wrist the entire time because she couldn't secure him to anything. <laughs> Yeah. So I mean, because she had a little glove and everything, but so I was pleased because it meant that I could be right up close to him and look. That is that is really fun. Do everything, admire him. Yeah. Uh, so it was very exciting, but uh, yeah. Thank so, you for those stories. Cool. And also, I love turkey vultures. And, uh, it gives us some ideas when you get a close-up look at a critter like that. Um, doing the close-up details, you had two views of the head, so. Sometimes it's looking this way and then it does this a lot. If you're waiting for it to do this again and it's doing this, you're just waiting. But if you have several drawings going, you can bounce back and forth between those. And then you have that zoomed out view, kind of getting the, the whole beastie together. Those are really great yeah. strategies. Yes, I admit that. Yeah, it's good to take advantage of the, the rare opportunity to actually get close to them. So, That's cool. really fun. Thank you. Really good to see you. Good and I, I will be uh, following up with an email about our kind of conversation about curiosity, but there's just so much going on right now okay. that, um, that that will happen, though. Um, so I look no, no, no worries. I'm sure I will continue to be curious, and so will everyone else in, in the meantime. <laughs> the <laughs> yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's uh, jump over and join the Schoen family. Um, hey there. Uh, welcome to the Nature Journal Workshop. Hi. Um, I have one from last week. It's really cool. So I was at a friend's house and uh, we were going down to our pond to Nature Journal. And uh, this is what I Nature Journal. Oh, let's see here. Oh, oh, you are you're starting with sort of a, a map of the larger area and then you're showing all the beasties who are taking advantage of the log um no uh those are notes that i did about the log oh yeah maybe hold it up again i'm because i'm having a little bit of focus trouble on my screen yeah we have bad internet here oh wait, oh, oh there there we go yes 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 oh what an interesting arching branch that's really cool. I like also the context of where we sort of see where you are in the in the pond here. Good use of words and pictures together to yeah. describe what you're seeing. And this is a dragonfly that was really, really close to me, which is really special to me because um, I live more in the woods, not really near a pond, so. You don't get to see that a lot. Oh, that's really cool. How close to you was the dragonfly? Uh, maybe three feet. Oh, that is really, really a great chance to... How long did it stick around for you? Um, a couple of minutes. Good job getting a speed sketch of that in there. A very, very good observations. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, um, I have one more thing to say. Um, yes. Why I couldn't come to um, last week's meeting is because um, I got a new pet. What kind of critter? Uh, got three mice. <gasps> oh, so you'd be really interested in a mouse drawing workshop. Yes. All right, we're going to do a Thursday mouse drawing. Um, I will get it on the, on the, could we show us your mice? Are they handy uh -huh. nearby? Uh, I would have to go downstairs, but I could show them one of them. The other okay. two are really fast, so but one okay. of them, I'll be right. That back. sounds that sounds really great. Yeah, drawing um, mice is 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 challenging because they're constantly like you know doing all these little things. But if you have a, an understanding of their 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 postures and some of the views of the head, it really helps you then be able to kind of rotate as that little mouse is kind of doing its thing and rotating around. Um, you definitely want to have several sketches of them nibbling because they'll hold still when they nibble. And the more mice you have in a container, the more they tend to kind of jump around and play with each other, which makes it more challenging. Um, the, but well, we'll put together a 
a uh, little workshop on specifically on drawing um, mice and and uh, sm other small rodents it will be a, a rodents of uh, not that unusual size. Oh, it's mouse time. Oh, this is going to be really fun. Thank you for running and getting this little one. Let's see your little friend. Oh, oh, adorable. Look at those little, look at those, 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 those beautiful eyes. I know. I have no idea why people think that mice are gross. Because look how cute this is. That's really, really sweet. That's a, uh, and it looks like it has really bonded with you. It feels totally comfortable there. Just checking you out, hanging out on your hands. Mm -hmm. Her name is Penny. She's the most nicest of my three. The other two are really fast, and I kind of, when I want to hold them, I kind of have to catch them. Yep. But she will just let me uh, put her on my arm and stuff. Aww. Yeah, Susan <laughs> noted that it's the, the copper penny. Yeah, the other two is name is Dime and Nickel. Dime and, and Nickel. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, we will, um, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to set up a, um, a, a, a small rodent drawing workshop. And um, I'm going to call it loose change. Ooh. And so when you see that on the calendar, you'll know what it's going to do. Would you be interested in being a co-host with me for that class? And for part of the class, what we could do is give Penny here, um, give, give her a little, um, if we could kind of create some little, uh, place where she could be in front of the camera, um, we could do some live sketching with Penny. Sure. Would that be fun? Yes, I would love to do that. All right. All right. I will look forward to it. So we'll have, and Penny, Penny, do you want to be a star? We should, be, we should ask Penny. Penny gives it a, a little, a, yeah. so uh, wiggle your nose if you think that's a good idea. Oh, apparently so. <laughs> All right, so we'll uh, the the three of us will will get together, and um, could I get you to shoot me an email, um, uh, or have your parents shoot me an email? I just want to, I want to get um, their 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 blessing and permission on this plan, and um, and then we will get together. We'll talk. We'll sort of make sure that we can kind of get a good view with little Penny. And um, then we'll have a, uh, a, 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 we'll get our mouse on. Okay, I'll tell my parents. Fantastic. And uh, you can find all my contact information on my website. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Um, all right. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, let's bop over to London, London Indium, um, with our friend Ray Bonto. Um, hi there. It's great to see you. Hold on. You can now unmute. Hello. Um, how are you? Doing very well. How's your juggling been going? Oh uh, yeah, I've been using these two guys, both Rubik's Cubes, but this one has been a little crazy because it's a square, but. <laughs> oh, and if you catch it wrong, that does that is that more painful on your hand? Well, you have to catch it like that instead of like that. Yes. You need to make it flat, and then you have to keep changing. <laughs> so what what I like about that is that you know on on any skill that you're developing, when you kind of get the basics of the juggling down, then upping your challenge by having objects of different weights, different sizes, um, really kind of uh, helps you continue to be, you're intentionally putting yourself into a more sort of challenging aspect of the, the growth curve. Whereas I'm sure if you had balls that were equally weighted, same size, it would be much easier. But 
Just like with nature journaling, if I'm drawing mice and I get this done, I can now make it more challenging by doing this skill. It's a little bit more challenging. And so you, as you kind of get one thing, you can up the challenge for yourself on developing any skill. And um, that's, that's cool. I, uh, the, uh, I saw a juggling act called the Flying Karamazov Brothers. And um, they uh, have people in their audience bring with them to the show objects that will be difficult to juggle. And then the um, audience gets to pick which of the objects by kind of a clap -a meter And then they will get out there and they'll juggle these things that people have brought, you know, like, it'll be like a bowl of jello. You know? <laughs> and yeah, they'll, so people will just kind of fiendishly um, come up with strategies of, of trying to, to stump the Karamazov brothers. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So what's going on in your journal these days? Yeah, as usual, I, what I do is I, um, I wait, probably do juggling and then I usually do stuff quickly. So I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I usually don't listen to steps. Um. <laughs> That's right. Often, often I'll put the 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 it it uh, the picture up on the the screen, and you're twelve steps ahead, while I'm kind of talking about the beak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but these these have a real sense of volume to them. Um, I like the way you're wrapping around contours with these. Mm. That's fun. Yeah, nice, nice sense of volume on that, that, that big, uh, that young great horns there. Those little guys yeah. poking out of the, their cubby. <laughs> hmm. Have you been able to get out in the field and do any um, field sketching? Not field sketching, but yeah, my other friend, yeah, mm -hmm. I went out with him and to a place where the place where we do nature journaling and but he was moving houses and so he couldn't find his nature journal so um i didn't do any because it's no fun yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. yeah it's and did you climb some trees uh, no well, i did i did see a kingfisher <gasps> Oh man, I have I've got okay. some serious kingfisher envy. The the kingfisher that you have over there in Europe, such a beautiful, beautiful little beastie. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that the belted kingfisher is not a spectacular bird. Oh yeah, but I'm your kingfisher that. goes to eleven. <laughs> That's really cool. It's really yeah. Cool. I thought it's flight. And yeah, we were just loitering around, and suddenly my friend said, "A bat!" <laughs> and then we saw some. <laughs> and <laughs> then he realized he was wrong, and he saw when we both saw some blue, and then it flipped around and showed some orange in flight. <laughs> Those, I mean, such a beautiful little bird, and just the the proportions on kingfishers are so much fun. Yeah. Just like, what? Like all, all the effort that should have gone into tail goes into make and, and legs goes into making just this ridiculous head and beak. So yeah. I always have such a hard time getting the proportions on those because they're just like, wow, wow. And then in Africa, there is this incredible radiation, adaptive radiation of kingfisher species so much fun there are all these terrestrial ones and then and then a whole bunch of there's giant kingfishers little pygmy kingfishers and everything in between and bright colors red oh yeah beaks, just oh man they do some kingfishers right over there that's fun yeah yeah my my friend's sister she was really excited because that's her favorite bird and that's whenever her brother bird. Yeah, and when her, whenever a brother sees it, she's too late. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then, I don't know, she was playing this game on her dad, which I don't think much of. She was like, 
dad, I saw a dinosaur. <laughs> and he was like, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And he was like, guess what I saw then? Uh, yeah, until Kingfisher. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and technically, cladistically, she's right. Yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But are yeah. Saurishians, but... Um, that's great. That well, that's really fun. Well, thank you for the Kingfisher story, and um, yeah, in, in enjoy your Kingfisher. Yeah, that's a, that's a such a beautiful, beautiful little birdie. Mm. Yeah, when I was in Rwanda, I would regularly get to go out by a pond, and this pond had uh, malachite kingfishers, and you could just sit there and they'd perch on a little reed in front of me and. Oh, Ah, love gorgeous little kingfishers. Yeah. Really good to see you, Ray Bonto. Good to see you too. All right. Um, let's join Gina. Um, Gina, it is great to see you. And Hi. hey there. Welcome. Hello. Okay. I was looking up uh, Malachite thing kingfishers right now. They look really cool. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the uh, and, and and just th there's also just all these these different kingfisher species, and I'm used to kingfishers going down and going into the water, but um, in lots of places um, uh, we we don't see that. Um, they're they're terrestrial like lizard catching like kookaburras. Oh yeah, you know, wow! Mm -hmm. And you're a kingfisher or mm -hmm. lizard bird. <laughs> King. they're, they're also fun because they're another one of these birds where there is what's called reverse sexual dimorphism, right? So the males okay. are not as pretty looking as the females. Like phalaropes, we were talking about phalaropes the other day, where the females are just like, "Whoa, I've got the color." And um, kingfishers, you'll find more interesting patterns and colors on the females than on the fellows. So I'm going to look this up later. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a rabbit hole. So, Happy to fall down. <laughs> what is happening in, um, in your journal these days? And have you had more um, shorebird experiences? When we last checked in with you, you had had this this in uh, your your ability to sort of see and understand shorebirds had just exploded mm -hmm. yes i have i actually got back from one just now oh. like as i was on the bus i i had your um i had <laughs> this room on and i was like listening i was like trying i i would because i wasn't able to draw but i was like just coming back and then i come in um, I turn on the computer and just as you're um, coloring the, it's just as you're first laying down your pencil sketches of the, the long-eared owl, I was like grabbing some dinner and like running here. Putting them in. <laughs> That's commitment. That's commitment. Well, I'm glad you made it. Tell us about your adventure out there. Did you make any sketches while you're out there with your shorebird friends? Yes. Um, but first of all, I need to... Um, rewind to two days ago on Mon on Sunday. And this week is the peak week of the honey buzzard migration here in Israel. So we get thousands upon thousands. Like the digits are like five digits long, six digits long. So we, we get millions of them. And wow. I really, really wanted to go because like it's this one week where the, we have like this, if it's a bell curve, we have this like really huge pouring in of honey buzzards and and i really wanted to go see them but so how, how many are you you're talking here so like um i think like fifty thousand, probably a hundred thousand maybe Whoa. Yes, like we have extraordinary numbers of honey buzzards pouring in um but so i don't have a car which is which makes bird watching a little bit difficult and so I went to my usual Carmel Mountain, Mount Carmel bird watching site, which is the one of the few places available by bus. 
and I spent two hours there and I did not see a single one. And I was very, very sad about that because apparently you have to, um, they, so they follow, yeah, sorry. Uh, so like, if this is the land, they follow a, um, a mountain range that's over here more to the east and I'm a bit here to the west. So they don't make that detour over here. Mm -hmm. And so I was hoping for like maybe two, maybe three, like, no, not a single one came my way. Oh. And was I was just sitting there being a little bummed and then um, I got really excited because I thought I had seen an amazing bird like I thought I saw a goshawk oh. like, super excited I was like oh my god a goshawk because it was it had that brown bag that pretty big bill a little that striped by the eye yeah Thing. So I was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. And I put it down on, I, I noted it down on eBird. Um, and I was really excited, but then it flew. And then I saw it had this shape, which is not, which is not exactly the shape of a goshawk in flight. Oh, it's a interesting slender bird. So uh turns out I made a mistake that a lot of bird watchers do, which is I got a female sparrow hawk confused for a, for a male goshawk because they are roughly the similar size and very similar shape. Yes, um, yes. And so, yeah, like, um, so I I really was hoping because like I, I wanted something to make up for the honey buzzards. So I was like, I want to, I want it to be a goshawk. I want it to be a goshawk. And I, and I had this really strong temptation, but um, Turns out that submitting that to eBird might have caused a lot of confusion in the bird community because goshawks have only been documented in Israel like twice in the past, mm -hmm. very few times. So um, I would have had a very long line of um, hopeful and angry bird watchers to deal with. <laughs> but, but, but isn't it isn't it fun? You know, when we we have what, what you also demonstrated there was kind of good you know, uh, birder hygiene, where you, mm -hmm. you, you had your first impression of what it was. And then you got more information. And you changed your mind in the presence of evidence. And I did. Mm -hmm. um, what a lot of people will do is they will just kind of, they'll try to turn whatever they, they, they see, you know, find to sort of do some special pleading and and sort of turn their um their sparrow hawk back into a goshawk but those those birds are um uh they're, they're both exhibitors right yes and believe me the temptation was very very strong it, it, it was there definitely was there like a it was it felt rather miserable from the fact that i didn't even see a single honey buzzard and I was so excited about the goshawk, and that also turned out to not be a goshawk. But, so I but, really was there. But you got to see a, a really good look at a sparrowhawk. That's true. Yeah, I learned. So I looked at the, I really tried to focus on the bigger picture that this is learning. Like, I can't yes. lie to myself and just force nature to be what I want it to be. Oh, I can't That's do that. the mindset. That's, that's the <laughs> mindset. That is great. Thank you. Um, and so, unfortunately, so, I could, could you show us the, that, that in-flight um, sparrowhawk profile again? Yes. So, like, the tail was much too long. And I have yeah. seen yeah. goshawks before when I was living in South Korea. They're, they're a lot bigger. And they don't, they don't have this, like, slender falcon-like aerodynamic build. They're a lot bigger. They're a lot more heavy set. Um, so, I was... I was like, the moment I saw saw it flying, I was like, okay, that's not, that cannot be a goshawk. Wow, that's really great. That's really cool. And also, it was really interesting because um, I, I think when I shared my journal like two weeks ago, on, on August 29th, I, I wrote down like Alpine Swifts. Mm-hmm. And two days ago, I went back, and I and there wasn't a single one there. Oh, interesting! Yeah, so, interesting. Yes. So, like the not only is the presence of birds interesting, the absence of birds is also very interesting. So it hints that they've already begun their migration; they were gone. 
Yeah, isn't that isn't that so? Yeah, everybody notices positive data, but nobody reports negative data, mm -hmm. and um, that is that makes it much more hard to we 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 re got to realize that when we don't see something that we're expecting to see, that actually is an event. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a real event. That's 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 cool. Mm -hmm. And so today um, I went with my friend again to uh, to go shorebird quizzing. Oh, <laughs> that's what you just got back from? Uh-huh. And so I didn't have a lot of time this week. I was really, really busy with lots of different stuff this week. So um, unfortunately, do you remember last week when you gave us homework to um, in internally? nature journal like I wonder I feel I think like how we feel inside yes I yes. I had really wanted to do that but I had absolutely no time but I definitely want to do it again like in the following week if I have time I, I think uh, it's a wonderful thing I hope I can do that this week um so I wasn't able to study shorebirds a lot this week I had no time like I had I drew like seven roughs and that was it mm -hmm. well those and, are rough sketches yeah, so these are just sketches just to see like the build, like the shape, et cetera, like the different poses they can get. Um, I didn't have a lot of time. And so, but this time I noticed that overall I was much more, my hand was a lot more steadier than last time. Yes. Oh, isn't that an interesting observation? Yes. And you're, and you're so catching like, all these little nuances of differences in, in posture and, and color here. Mm -hmm. And so I was learning like, okay. Um, and I saw a couple of lifers, like some birds that I've never seen before. So, and I was able to write that down. And also when, um, when my friend pointed the field scope at that new bird and I had never seen it before, I knew I'd never seen it before. I mm -hmm. was like, what is this? Like, I don't, I don't think I've seen this before. So I was able to write that down as a lifer. Um, and it was also really fun because we saw some Dunlins and they had like summer plumage left over, which is like a black yeah. patch on their yeah. belly. And so, yeah, I was able to write down a lot of notes as they came a lot more notes than compared to last time where the notes were rather sparse comparatively, relatively. Mm -hmm. So like, this is my first time bird watching, like shore bird watching. And there are some notes, but not too many drawings. And this was today. Yes. Yeah. You, the, the more the more you understand the critters, the, the easier that's going to become. That's cool. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and then we uh, and then my friend was like watching through this field scope. And then he says, oh, the, the sea, the gulls are starting to fly. Is there a predator? And we both look up and sure enough, we see this female marsh harrier just circling above and it was so interesting like we had spent pri prior to the marsh area we had already spent about like 45 minutes 30 minutes just observing the shorebirds going about their business and then with the advent of this predator it was so interesting to see the entire atmosphere of the pond just change like that Yes. And yes. and how like this, the, the gulls just all took off at once in a white cloud and the shorebirds took cover and they started making alarm calls and every and all the birds got a little more more tense. It was really interesting. The, the atmosphere just changed. It was so cool. What a great and observation. Thank mm. you. And um, I'm not very great at drawing clouds, but I tried to draw like the huge clouds behind and how the Harrier just lazily circled up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, and it was very interesting because I saw a snipe. I, I know this isn't a very good drawing of a snipe because I'm not very familiar with their anatomy yet, so I'm going to redraw this later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd always thought that snipes just hid inside the reeds and like never came into water but um we saw a snake we saw a snipe today just in open water like fishing around with the rest of the shorebirds and that was very very cool so this that behavior really was very interesting as yeah. well mm -hmm. and like more nuances more little differences and 
my friend, he's he's been a bird ringer for a very, very long time. He's been, and so like he he showed me a Savvy's, um, a Savvy's warbler that responded to a to a call like and I I wrote down its its call up here. Ooh, oh, and, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. And then he immediately like told me like three, five things that I could use to um to um, identify its species. Like he was like, hey Gina, notice how its its um its throat has like pale streaks and its legs are pinkish yellow and its tail is really long, twice the length of reed warblers. And he just like re relays these little ID points off like within um like half a minute so cool and i'm just like holding one pencil like here and you're like right here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh this is great this is what oh, fun and it oh, is so oh, much fun oh, to have oh, yeah. um kind of a peer group that you can just go out and uh and and geek out like that absolutely and we went to this place that's full of fish pond and we saw like a whole bunch of flamingos so this is the first time i've tried to draw um like a, a a landscape so they have like trees and israel's pretty big on palm trees i don't know if they're native i hope they are because there's a lot of them so like there's some palm trees there's the, there's a fish pond with a whole bunch of flamingos sleeping and a lot of them were gray so i'm assuming that they were um the gray ones were all juveniles youngsters mm -hmm. yeah and um and like just like lots of these those little different things and I tried to and I saw so another snipe and yeah like today uh the, drawing the snipe uh that made me think of the cryptic camouflage it's like the cat the snipe mm -hmm. is so camouflaged that I thought huh I would love to learn how to draw that so that's how I suggested it and and it's very cool like he, my friend just gave me so many like little tips, like like all of these are his tips. And like the fact that ruffs have like their tail kind of like sticking up like that is also his tip oh, is amazing. Fun. You know, those very often, those are the little cues, the tips that are not anywhere in any field guides. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you get time with the organism and all that comes together. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and so I'm really getting a good hand on it. Like I did even better than last time. I'm learning, I'm seeing new birds every time I go there and I'm just getting new birds to add to my bird study list. And this is great because now I know which birds are common here, which birds are rare here. And that's really giving me an outline of how to progress. And so hopefully I can do shorebirds maybe like two more times and then I can move on to maybe gulls or, <laughs> or like really That's tiny cool. passerines that are so hard to see hiding in the bushes passerines are difficult for me that's too. right yeah for and for sketching purposes those shorebirds that are just sort of hanging out there in front of you that's so nice to have a cooperative bird you can put them in the scope and mm -hmm. they'll you know they'll take a nap in front of you and if you're looking at say warblers they're bouncing mm -hmm. around in the bush yeah <laughs> and uh if you try to put a scope on them you get a picture of an empty branch <laughs> i feel that so much yeah <laughs> and also how isn't it aren't flamingos fun oh yes they are Absolutely. i love that sketch you had of that that sleeping flamingo with its head back on itself mm -hmm. just a sort of lump <laughs> of yeah the lump of flamingo um <laughs> You know, they're just mm -hmm. hanging out there, krilling time. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it was really amazing because when we, we watched them until the sun set and they were all sleeping, all of them, like two were feeding, maybe out of 70. And then the moment, like it, as it became like 6.30, 6.35, they all started to wake up and start eating again, and which was really cool. And, and 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 that eating posture is just so weird with the the head down like this, yeah. With their head upside down, kind of uh -huh. walking around. What fun! <laughs> what fun! Absolutely. And uh, and I read in a book recently that the that the reason that the flamingo bills are like bent like like, like that is so that like. If, if their beaks were straight and they open them underwater, they and they filter out krill kind of like 
um, baleen whales do. And so if, it, if their beaks were straight, like the, uh, the gap between the beaks would be larger at the tip than here. And so by, by having the beak like bent 90 degrees, if they open their beak, the gap between the top and the lower beak would be uniform all the way to the end. And that allows them to catch all the krill without letting them slip out at the end. And it's mind blowing, it's very, very cool. Nature, I know. Structure <laughs> and function. That's really, really fun. Oh That's yeah. That's so cool. That mm -hmm. is really neat. And so wow. yeah, um I and Hard also to I my mind around that beak. <laughs> oh man that's that's really fun those are really cool and um i've also realized that um if i don't have a car i also i i found somebody who was offering honey buzzard tours like to, tours to go see honey buzzards so i called him and he's like ah do you have a car and i said no and he said that's gonna be a problem i'm sorry i can't help you and i was like oh no <laughs> that is really so, funny it is and so i decided to be more aggressive and from now on i'm going to make really good food and bribe my car owning friends with them oh that's smart uh-huh you know I, and it also makes me think that i should start offering uh pelagic uh pelagic trips and tours yeah that'd um, be very cool like wouldn't that be a, fun? and then if somebody good. calls me up i'll be like do you have a boat? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, because no, that's not that's not gonna work. <laughs> yeah. You know, good good luck. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um or like, can you swim? Like, can you swim with a camera in one hand? No, that's not gonna work. Yeah, that's that's, that's gonna be a problem then. Oh, so, Gina, this is so exciting. You've got this, um, you know, this, uh, your, your appetite for, 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 for learning is just wonderful. And Thank you. your mindset of, you know, I'm going to look for clues and, and you're a lot of people when they kind of think they've got something figured out, then they'll do everything they can to, to force that conclusion like any other evidence that you'll try to twist it in that and what i see mm -hmm. you doing is that you're only kind of accepting a claim in proportion to the strength of the evidence for it and mm -hmm. as more evidence comes up you're flowing with that and not trying to kind of contort it to be like i need you to be a square peg i need you to be square peg but just kind of accepting like you know that this is actually a round peg and mm -hmm. going with um, changing again, changing your mind in the presence of evidence. That's that's wonderful. So Thank you. good science mind. <laughs> that's, that's... Thank you. And I'm also going to start cultivating my business mind because I'm going to I'm getting more and more confident with my cooking skills these days. So I have a couple of friends who have cars and I'm going to go listen. Take me to watch to go uh, to yeah. which in which mountain to go watch raptors, and I will give you um, a like five cheese rolls. Yeah, something. we'll 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 cook for birds. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's great. So th I I tried to do that today with my birding friend. I said I'll give you two cheese rolls if if you go take me to see the hunting birds, and he said, haha, no, sorry, that's way too far away not today <laughs> but I, I got rolls. three <laughs> cheese rolls <laughs> all right we just three no no <laughs> maybe i should uh bring some more because i only brought three because i thought he would succumb to two i yeah. underestimated yeah. my opponent <laughs> that's right that's right we need some strategy and I also wish oh, yeah. you luck on your uh, application for the um, forensic wildlife examiner job. Thank you. May I talk about that or am I taking too long because I see like two other people who also want to share? Let's just share a little bit about that. And then uh, we'll join Holly and then Avea and then it's mm -hmm. lunchtime. 
Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know, I applied to become a wildlife forensic scientist in Ashland, Oregon, and Jack really helped me out with that. And so please, thank you very much, Jack. And interestingly enough, I, I knew this lady who was uh, working, who's working in Jerusalem here. And she's the, and I had a Zoom meeting with her today after struggling to schedule with her for like a month and a half. And I met her today this morning and turns out she is the only certified wildlife forensic scientist in the country. She is on the board of the Society of Wildlife Forensics. And she said, you know what, Gina, I have a meeting with the board on Friday. If you want, send me your resume and I'll put in a good word for you. So I am just like oh. dancing. I'm like, yes, thank you so much. And she even said a very, a very Israeli thing. She said, if they reject you, let me know. And let's see what we can do about that. <laughs> there we go. There we go. And you know, oh, that's, so cool. that's that's so much fun. And you've done all this this research, you know, studying feather wear on birds. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, and your 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 evidence based mindset, I think, would also be perfect for such a, a position like that. Oh, um, I hope so, so. We're we're wishing you well. We wish you luck in this, and that Thank also you. would bring you um, here to the states. It would. It would bring me to the West Coast, and I've never been there before. Ah, so we'll have to get you a raincoat if you're going to go to Oregon. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Gina, so, uh, uh, everybody, uh, uh, let's let's wish uh, Gina really good luck on that. Um, we, uh, so we are we're rooting for you. Thank you so much, Jack, and and to everybody here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's thank thank you for being with us, Gina. Let's join Holly. Holly, you can now unmute, and I'll add you into the spotlight here. It's great to see you. You too. You too. I just want to uh, to show my owl because I kind of uh, if, I, if you could see that or not. Ooh. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I kind of got into it after we were talking for a while. I just started doing, you know, kind of like a, a tiger stripe line, and I just started. It was kind of fun, you know. <laughs> so, that's that's fun, and that 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 dark background behind it also kind yeah, of gives. I think that you know, I've got. Sometimes I'll do pictures where it's just, you know, the bird floating in the middle of the white snow field. Um, but when we add some context in, we start telling more of a story. You know, mm -hmm. rather than it just saying owl, right? Yeah. We're, yeah. you know, we're, we're like cold owl at dusk, you know, and, and it starts <laughs> to turn into just sort of more and more and more of a... Um, uh, more and more of the experience can kind of come into it. That's really fun. Yeah, yeah. When you, I, I don't know, a long time ago, you you were, I think you were drawing a bird, and you you brought out the, in, I think it's in Danthrone blue, and you went swoosh around the bird, and it's just like the bird just came to life. So ever since yeah. then, I've tried to think about that, like how helpful that is. And I just had one more thing. I I tried to draw a bug. Um, with colored oh. pencil, um, which turned out pretty good. And on this side, I, I just can't quite do this translucent thing with watercolor. Doesn't I don't get it yet. So I do it with color pencil. And then on this side, I added just now a bit of uh, very dark paint. And that kind of gave it that little bit of a pop for the shiny part in the middle. Yes. So I, that, was, yeah. that was my little, that was my little adaptive trying to something new, but um, can't really see. Uh, have you been doing the bug nights? No, I'm going to. I want to. I haven't gotten to it yet. But the bug yeah. nights, very cool go experience. Um, yeah, you're right. So having the dance of colors, so mm -hmm. you've got the greens and the blues going on in there, and then you're going to mm -hmm. crisp black is a great way of suggesting the iridescent um, and shiny colors on things. If you let the instead of going to have that black um if it sort of fades more slowly then we get yeah. the feeling of looking at something that's much more matte um so that's that's really cool that's yeah. Yeah. that's a fun beetle thanks for thanks for letting me share thank you it's great to see you, you too 
Um, all right, let's um, join the mad botanist. Um, Avea, it's good to see you. And let's see what is, there we go. Well, what's happening in your journal? Oh, <clears throat> my journal. Um, oh, before I show that though, I wanted to, before I forget, um, on the subject of camouflage, if anybody is really fond of children's books, there's this really great mm -hmm. series by this lady named Ruth Heller, um, back from my own childhood. And, um, and so she's got an entire series about camouflage and animals. And so I wanted to suggest people check this out. So like, for example, we have this one here. We have- Oh, that's so cute. At dawn, that is, owl. That is so sweet. Oh, that's adorable. It its eyes and then is hard to recognize. And so then you can see that like what Jack is saying, that she incorporates the colors of the surrounding environment um in yeah. order to hide them and so you get a lot of these um it's like our parakeet here oh this is so much fun so um it, just if anybody wanted to play with not only um um what is it called oh, there's um, no way you could hide a bitter how could you hide possibly hide a bitter oh there <laughs> that's that's so cool yeah I once saw a bittern that was doing its hiding posture with the beak straight up in the air, um, standing right next to a roadway. It wasn't realizing that it wasn't in the in the weeds. Oh, this is so cool. This book is, oh, these are really fun. So and it's so strange how when you see somebody doing their camouflage, oh, let's check out some of the crocodile hiding. Oh, yeah. Okay, totally. Yeah. Um, but, but keep talking while I just flip through. Um, yeah, go for it. But, but yeah, it's, it's fun to see um, both things when they're hiding very successfully and then when they're not hiding successfully. <laughs> yep. Um, you're like, why are you not being successful? So here are some just examples of. Oh, yes. Look at like little fish. Look at little fish. You don't want to get near that leaf. Oh, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> And I like that. I like that um, that she shows the context where they hide exactly instead of just hearing about it. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Here's a chameleon. Oh, the chameleons. What was the name of the chameleon again? That that you. That you um, told? The, the 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 girls found Bob. Bob. Bob the chameleon in in Africa, um, and um, then they. Uh, the every chameleon that they named they the every chameleon that they found they named Bob. And and what was the word in in um in Swahili for chameleon again? Oh, uh, kinyonga, I think kinyonga. Kinyonga. So how to hide an octopus and my like three year old or four year old handwriting because she oh, wrote. Oh, oh, that is so sweet. <laughs> so you, can see, you can see that these are ones that I've loved since I was a kid. Um, yes. Autographed and. Oh, so look at that. How to hide an octopus. We have how to hide a gray tree frog, which was fun. How to hide a polar bear, speaking of earlier with the polar bears. Yeah, she signed this, she autographed this for me in 1988 when I would have been like two years old. Um, so we have a polar bear here. And then, yeah. That's really fun. And then um, fun. last but not least. Lost and found edges. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, exactly. She, she didn't even have to outline the entire thing. And then um, this one, I didn't even realize that they had for a while. So it took me a while to track this down. Um, but then I did. And so, yeah. Fun. Um, so yeah, just wanted to just, yeah. Or the fun thing is to look at this and then be like, okay, what animal is being hidden in here? Can anybody see the hidden animal? Let's see. I didn't have a clue. Um, um, um. There seems to be somebody over on the right hand side. <laughs> uh, oh, wait a minute. There's somebody over on the left hand side. Yep. And there's so there's probably somebody in the middle. Yep, I'm imagining. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I see some legs. Yeah. So there are some indeed some uh, crab spiders. Yep. That's fun. Um, so, so yeah, just wanted to say that that's an awesome book to read, um, series to read. If just if you love camouflage, um, someday I want to 
draw like she does the, all of the different and the way you do with the owls. Um, speaking of bug nights, this is kind of a rough sketch because I didn't have time to color things in. But we recently got up to some fun with a blister beetle who had these long, um, long uh, three dimensional stripes uh, on on the elytra. I think I think that's the elytra. Or, or no, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and. And I was like, oh my God, now I know where Tim Burton gets his inspiration um, because the album <laughs> was super duper long, but had these long stripes. And I was thinking that's totally Tim Burton. She's um, talking about possibly doing a thing called Invertober where we get to talk about- Invertober, that's a yeah. fun idea. We're maybe talking about scary um, animals, which would be really fun, especially um, if I get to convince her to talk about zombie bugs, um, it'd be fun. Here's a- um, I don't know if I showed this one or not, but this one was one of the giant water bugs. And then seeing the little areas underneath, um, how the legs all intersect, they're super complicated to draw. Once you can draw bugs, then everything else doesn't seem quite as complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I recommend That's people fun. checking out, um, let's see, I'm not done yet, but I found your diagram on spiders, so I'm working on that. Uh -huh. Let us see. Oh yeah, I didn't finish with this one because everybody got distracted that day by the colors. Uh, Susan kind of what? Talked. Yeah, so oh. I didn't. Oh, everybody was hypnotized by the colors oh. of this of oh. the crazy bug. I need to go back and try again because I could not do it quite the justice that it deserved, and oh. I want to. I really want to. <laughs> oh, that's neat. That's some crazy. Is fun. So, too. so explain bug night for. Uh, hold on, I'm I'm gonna um, you know, I'm gonna have uh, Susan come in and join you, um, just so that you guys can geek. Whoops, hold on. Uh, we'll try this one more time. Um, add spotlight, and you can now unmute. I was going to say, I can't believe you got even managed to the legs because I, I didn't even get that far. I, I was, yeah, like you say. But you got the, <laughs> so you did the by the code. Did. You, you were it way was, better. It, was, it was pretty fun, yeah. I finally, finally managed to get along with the tape. If you remember. Yeah. So I'm going to have to rewatch that one. <laughs> Same. Yeah, that, that, was, that was pretty cool. So I mean, folks, folks should definitely join. I can't, oh, I can't believe you got a side view too. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's neat. That is really neat. And then there's so, a, so for people who haven't been describe well, describe was, bug night uh, for us. Pyropyja. I'll put this in the so, so how would you describe bug night to people who? Uh... So, so um, this there's this lovely lady named Trisha Nichols who lives in the Philadelphia area, to my to my knowledge, um, and she has a pretty big bug collection. She is the sort of person who will break for bugs. So if she's driving along the way and she happens to hit like. Um, what are they called? A pepsis, which I didn't finish drawing because I was overwhelmed. If she hits a pepsis with her car, she will stop, go back in the road, find the pepsis that she hit, take it home and add it to her collection. Pepsis meaning a tarantula hawk uh, wasp. So she will find cool. the bug that she hit with her car. So she gets out her collection. She um, has a straw along. And here, in fact, I'm going to minimize so you can see Susan's better. Um, so um, so she will have a straw along, she'll draw, she'll name the parts so that you eventually, you get really good at hearing the term tarsus and knowing what she's talking about. You, you know about pronotums and mesonomas and metanomas. Like you get to know the bug vocabulary big time, um, the more you're with her. And then occasionally, well actually like every single time, multiple times a, a session, we get to, to have Trisha go down rabbit holes with us. So we get to ask her questions like, we'll be drawing one thing and then we'll start talking about caterpillars. And then she'll be talking about poop umbrellas. And then next thing you know, um, we'll be talking about um, how they camouflage using bird turds. And then somehow it leads into praying mantises and us arguing about like, what is the specialized term for praying mantises camouflage? I recently wrote her and I was like, is it called aggressive mimicry? Just like, that sounds about right. And so like, we just dive. It's really fun. And of course, Susan's there. So, you know, we have some good times with the diving. Oh, um, so. Probably a lot of times too. It's, good. it's a good bunch, yeah. This is cool. And, this is cool. and she gets them under the microscope. I don't know if that was stated. Sorry. Yes, I should have said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you get like a like, really good look at some of the like cool parts and everything. Uh, mm, mm, mm. So, yeah, it's pretty fun. 
let me see if I've gotten really good. I think I've shown most of these to everybody before, so y'all probably have seen these, but here's one of my ones that is more about diagrams because I'm proud of the diagrams. Um, and so you can see that to talk about like the, the parts here, she'll say like, oh, look, labial palps, AKA mouth fingers. So we come up with vocab to describe things Oops, or, yeah. or, um, or like loop in the snoot. Um, she'll talk about how, what the size is because she knows that there are a lot of um, nature journalers there. And I like that she gave this in the metric system. Um, so then she'll talk about, what is that? Yeah, this scutellum up here. She'll talk about coxa and femur and trochanter. She'll, she'll give you all of the vocab, um, <clears throat> which we try to take down unless she distracts us with the shiny and then we're doomed. If she distracts us with the shiny, we're like, yeah. But because it's on YouTube, you can just go back and watch the YouTube video again. So she's got months of it. But it's fun to do it live because then you can join in the chat. Yeah, that's um, really and good. They are Thursday nights at 10 p.m. Uh, mm -hmm. Eastern Eastern time. And also Sundays at some time that I'm not able to attend. So I guess. Um, yeah. Oh, look at, yeah, this one, you, you just, just you by owned <laughs> that iridescence. I couldn't, could uh, stay, stay for that one, but there you go. Yeah. I got, I got totally blown away by the iridescence and didn't take enough notes of the body parts and I had to go back and watch it again. But it was after Jack had taught his iridescent on birds class. And then, you know, pretty soon afterwards this happened and I'm like, <gasps> you know, like, who follow me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so much fun called the steel blue cricket hunter and here i can get you the url oh wait it. sydney got it uh, um sydney. and i think that that was it, it oh yeah wait there was one other thing um so i don't know if folks are aware of this already i think people are beginning to get aware i only just found this out like within the last few days there's currently a huge crisis going on in san francisco bay um there is an algal bloom that is causing hundreds of fish to wash up on the shores all throughout the bay dead. And recently Marley did an interview with somebody last night actually, um, who is currently doing the citizen science work necessary on iNaturalist. So I wanted to let people know as well, we were talking about doing surveys and, and Gina was mentioning earlier the absence of creatures. So it's also good to notice if there's massive die-offs and to document that as well on iNaturalist. Um, it's not only for the living creatures. Um, so I wanted to let people know about that to inspire people to mm. use that tool for that reason as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Oh, wow. Hey, um, isn't this community fun? I mean, just to get to bop all around the world with you folks here and see what you're thinking, um, uh, meet your mice, um, and one of the things I think that is really powerful to do is to for us to start to reach out and start to get to know other people. I want to encourage people who feel comfortable doing so to um, you can uh, you know, do we, do we know if we have the private chat function enabled? We don't, but we could re-enable it if, if... I, I think we might want to do that. Here's what I'm thinking. I want to encourage people to make friends who geek out like you geek out. And um, the um, the more that we strengthen you know the connections between us, we can make new friends this way. And uh, and our, our, our peer group of kind of like-minded um, <clears throat> souls and nature nerds um, will just, you know, swell and grow. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for joining us. And I, um, I really look forward to this coming week of wild wonder as well as um, I will be continuing to join you um, every Wednesday. Oh, and um, let's see, uh, one of the suggestions was phonology and how do you teach about that? That's a great topic for one of our Nature Journal Educators Forum. So 
somebody at the start said, how do you, how can we, you know, teach about phonology and how can we do that in our journals? We'll make that a topic for our entire Nature Journal Educators Forum and we'll kind of come up with, we'll crowdsource best practices for that. Um, and I also look forward to uh, continuing to see all of you on Thursdays. Um, and um, anyone who needs, you can reach out to me anytime as well. Um, I'm easy to find. You go to my website. That contact link has my phone number, my email, my address, or my post office box. And so you can reach me through all sorts of, um, of, of different ways. And, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being kind. Thank you for encouraging each other. Um, as Aveo was mentioning, using our science and our journaling to document you know, the problems around us, we can actually, we can really use our journals as a tool for stewardship. And together, uh, we can make a, a big difference, inspiring other people to, to join you in taking care of this beautiful planet. Thank you all. Be well, and I'll see you again soon. Navea, thank you so much. You've got my back. Always. Thank you so much, Jack. Take care, friends. Wild wonder. Coming in how many hours? Cool. It'll be here soon.